Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. The soccer stadium planned for the city's downtown west neighborhood will be privately owned and largely privately funded. But today we want to talk about that caveat, largely. The Taylor family will own St. Louis's team, and it has sought $30 million in government support via tax credits from the state of Missouri. Those plans seem to hit something of a snag last month. And joining me now to talk about it is Jacob Kern. He's a reporter at the St. Louis Business Journal who's been covering this story. Jacob, welcome to the show. Hi there. How are you? So the Taylors were seeking this $30 million in tax credits from the Missouri Development Finance Board. And $15 $15 million was supposed to be voted on in a meeting last December. And then things kind of got complicated. What happened? Well, first of all, I don't even think we knew that they wanted this money until the city submitted this application to the state saying we want the $30 million in credits to go to the soccer stadium. But then we got word that the state had already allocated the credits for 2019 and that had given them to different projects. Correct. And they said, we will not go above that cap. The, the Governor Parsons administration said that we won't do it. And so I think, you know, they can come back in January for maybe all of that 15 for 2020. But it, I think will likely be less than that anyway. So I think the conclusion that you can reach because normally when these applications are put in, it's kind of a done deal. Both sides know. So the city and, and the team and the state, they already worked out some kind of a deal. So in this instance, I think the only thing that we can, you know, sort of come to the conclusion of is that there was some kind of miscommunication or somebody reneged or something happened. And it happened so late in the process. It was like this meeting was set. There were some quotes in the newspaper that made it sound like the people who were going to be voting on this were on board. And yet all of a sudden, do you think it was new information that came to light or any speculation on what could have happened behind the scenes? Well, what I have heard is that the city got indications that the cap would be, you know, they would go over it mm -hmm. and that somehow... That was a problem. And that somehow that on the state side, the mind was changed. Now that's from the city's perspective. I've not really heard anything from the state's perspective in terms of this, so I don't know. Okay. I think there's only a few things that can really happen because it's not as if this will kill this development, right? It's more that um, either the tailors who will own the team will have to eat the cost of the difference. If you don't get the 30, say they get 10, well, that's a $20 million difference, or they could change the development. So maybe scale back correct. what they were going to offer. Yeah, they could do that. Do we have any sense at this point of what their reaction to this might be? No one has really talked about this publicly other than, you know, some some statements that don't really address the heart of the issue. It's just a blind, you know, we appreciate the state, we appreciate the city, we appreciate everyone, blah, blah, blah. You know. So Lieutenant Governor Mike Kehoe, he sits on this board, and he had previously told the Post-Dispatch that he and Governor Parson have a great relationship with Mayor Lida Cruz and will absolutely be a partner going forward. There's no doubt in my mind. Have you heard anything from the Lieutenant Governor? Is, is he attempting to make something happen here? I've not heard from the Lieutenant Governor. I think a lot of people seized on that comment as an indication of We'll do whatever you want. But if you if you parse it and you read it closely, being a partner could mean we'll do nine million in 2020 and not, you know, the whole 30 over two years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I mean, I know there were sports columnists who sort of seized on those comments and things like that. But but you're saying maybe don't read so much into that. Well, it's a generic comment. I mean, it's not it's not overly specific. Now, so they were looking at this $30 million in total. They wanted $15 million last year, and the idea was that they would come back this year and then ask for $15 million this year. When will we start to get a sense of how much they're going to ask for this year and um, the board's response to that? I think pretty soon. I don't remember the exact date 
for the January meeting, but it, it will be coming in a matter of weeks. So the city, I think, will submit a new application. Hopefully this time both sides have squared away what that dollar amount is going to be. Um, and it, it, both sides, have, including the state, have sort of given indications that, yes, there will be some smaller amount so that state taxpayers will be helping to do this. Um, just not to the same level. It's interesting that they came in asking for this. And as you say, everybody kind of thought it was a done deal, the fact they made it to this agenda. And yet, as you say, no one is talking about pulling the plug on this stadium deal if they can't get the full $30 million. Now, Ray Hartman wrote a column in my former newspaper, the Riverfront Times, and he said, he's very critical of this ask, and said that $30 million was, quote, pocket change to the team, that they didn't really need this money. Does the fact that it's clearly going to be moving forward forward even without it. Does that somewhat prove his point? I understand his point. I think also that um, it's a massive investment from the Taylors. I mean, even if you think about if these are billionaires, well, hundreds of millions of dollars is a lot of money, even to somebody like that. And, um, you know, I, I think you also kind of have to think about these soccer teams are not some kind of huge profit machine. And the Taylors have said that. I mean, they have said, we view this as a totally civic enterprise. This is not some kind, this is not enterprise part two, right? They're not doing this to make money. <laughs> right. Um, we're talking to Jacob Kern of the St. Louis Business Journal about the city's new uh, MLS soccer stadium. We did get a couple questions from our listeners that came in via Twitter and email. I want to toss these your way. Um, Jerry asks if you've heard anything about whether the city's port authority could be expanded. He says this would enable the creation of a port district for the stadium that could levy a 1% sales tax. Yeah, so this is a part of the city subsidies that are going to the stadium too. So not only are state taxpayers helping, but city taxpayers are too. And I believe it was supposed to be the, to the tune of, I can't remember, but 20 million or 20 to 30 million, something like that. Now, two of the mechanisms are special sales taxes, so a SID and a TDD. The Board of Aldermen, I don't know if they've ever seen a special sales tax that they didn't like. So those are probably likely to go through. They'll approve these even for like a single family home, much Correct. less a yeah. giant it's, it's new crazy. investment like it's, this. It, yes. So I don't, they always approve those. Because of what happened in St. Louis County with the port authority there, I think that soured that part of the plan because the plan was to expand the city's port authority and levy another 1% tax. Well, the Port Authority in St. Louis County was mentioned many times in a federal indictment. So that caused city lawmakers to say, wait a minute, do we necessarily want to be doing that? My understanding is that if they do not expand the Port Authority to the entire city of St. Louis, they can actually carve out an expansion just for the stadium site and that that is the alternative that perhaps will be more palatable to aldermen. Would they have to have a path that would connect it to the river in order I don't, to do I, that? Or <laughs> they could just have this island? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I, it, it's not that the Port Authority is all right on the river. It includes some sort of adjacent land to the river. So but. downtown West could well qualify. Interesting. Well, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, Ken from South County also sent us a question via email, and he's talking again about this stadium. He says, will future tax revenue produced by the project and surrounding properties increase future tax revenues? If so, it seems that a two-year tax credit during construction, which would be non-revenue producing years for the MLS owners, would be appropriate as it would produce a long-term tax benefit. Is there any talk about giving them this money in credits in a very short short-term sort of way while the construction project is going on? Well, um, I mean, it is it, it is short-term. If, if you think about that, it was just supposed to be over these couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the question about does, will this increase tax revenues overall, I have to think that maybe the answer is yes, because you'll, you have to remember that um, the stadium is pushing north uh, uh, above market, mm -hmm. buying some property from a school that would not have paid property taxes, um, a couple other entities that maybe would not have, and developing parking lots, things like that. that things that would pay taxes. Yes, and, and also that would totally change the character of those blocks. I mean, it's, it's kind of a dead zone. It is. You know, 
Yeah. So we could see some investment there that could raise tax revenue. Sure. Well, it sounds like Ken from South County then would be in favor of giving them some sort of tax break. Now, I also did want to talk just briefly about um, the Taylor family. They have been in the news in a completely different story. This is one that you broke on Friday. Um, where you've been reporting on what was happening behind the scenes with the mayor's decision just before Christmas to halt exploration of airport privatization. What do we now know about the Taylor family's role in that? Well, what we know is that um, the chair of Civic Progress, which is an organization that's made up of area CEOs, was skeptical of airport privatization. Warner Baxter, the uh, CEO of Ameren, and was communicating with Lyda Krusen right before, several times right before she made the decision to end this. What we also know is that Andy Taylor, who's of course the executive chairman of Enterprise and the patriarch of the Taylor family, and David Kemper, who's the executive chairman of Commerce Bank Shares, also were skeptical of this. Mm -hmm. They haven't really said why, but they, um, at the beginning of the week when uh, Mayor Krusen killed this, they flew to Dallas and they met with Tom Nealon, who is the number two executive at Southwest Airlines, um, which is very interesting that they would uh, 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 take the time to fly down. You know, I mean, it mm-hmm. seems like maybe it was a serious thing to them. And do we have a sense of whether they were lobbying Southwest to be against this or whether Southwest was trying to get them to stop it. Well, I think what people maybe sometimes forget is that Southwest agreed to privatization. They agreed with Linda Martinez, a, a the pre- deputy mayor, correct, a a uh, a preliminary framework for privatization. So they said, you know, in a preliminary way, this is how revenues will flow. We can work with this. We can do this based on what the city's deal with us would be. Mm-hmm. Um, so that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be the other way around. That the business leaders wanted to stop this and wanted Southwest on their side. To help. And so all these, um, this information about who we know, who was meeting with who, how were you able to find all this out? Was this Uh, a sunshine request? (laughs) No, no. It would just be... Secret (laughs) sources. Something like that. That's all right. Well, props to you. It was a great story. And then um, you've also been a really busy guy this morning. You're back on the airport beat. Um, Tell us where you were and what you found out there. I went down to the Carpenters uh, Hall, the union. It's a big union, 22,000 members, and they're also in Kansas City. And they uh, and Adolphus Pruitt of the city uh, NAACP, even before airport privatization ended, said, we think this is a good idea for a different reasons, kind of, uh, between them. Um, but they said this morning that Um, we want to accept bids from these companies that are interested in operating Lambert, even though the city hasn't asked for them. So they're hoping, it sounded like, to sort of solicit the bids themselves, make it public, then sort of let the machinations of city government take place because it would be, I think, pretty remarkable and compelling if a, some one or multiple of these companies came forward and said, we're offering $2 billion. What do you think? So you think or they think that might be tantalizing enough to city political leaders that they could jumpstart this process that the mayor hoped to declare dead? It could be. I mean, that's a lot of money, especially for our, you know, sort of most struggling large government of the region. I mean, just, you know, Adolphus Pruitt made the point this morning that Um, North St. Louis looks like a war zone. That's a point that many people have made. And if we can, you know, infuse capital into there, that that would be a great thing. Of course, there's no guarantee that it would go to North St. Louis. I mean, that would be a legislative process through the aldermen. Mm -hmm. And there's no guarantee that these companies will still put proposals forward. But they're saying, bring them, bring them on. Yes, yes. It's There's no guarantee, but it is interesting. It'll be really interesting to see what happens with this. I have a feeling we're going to have to have you back on. So, Jacob Kern of the St. Louis Business Journal, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU.
Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. St. Louis Public Radio's The Gateway gives you the day's news first thing every weekday morning. From the ever-evolving relationship between St. Louis City and County to developments in the Missouri and Illinois state capitals and reports from our correspondents in Rolla and the Metro East. We put it all in a roughly 10-minute package with clarity and context. Download The Gateway wherever you get podcasts.